you know, the truth, it's a, <laughs> it's a very complex thing that we do not fully understand to this day. The systems that control the response to what we call pathogen, which is everything that tries to come into your body, non-living and living, and can in effect sometimes, whether it wants to or not kill you, this is your defense system. And this is something that has been evolving for not only hundreds of millions of years, but in the last 20 years, this is something in healthcare that we have learned how to harness more than ever. And we're still only getting at the kind of the beginning. So what this GIF or GIF is going to, is showing you is in red here. This is a natural killer cell and we'll see them in a sec. It has bound to a virally infected cell and what you're seeing these like teal spouts here, that is the virally infected cell like exploding basically. What NK cells will do and what we'll see what they do is they attach and they basically send over poisons that attack these cells. So it's very cool to watch it work. It's even cooler to watch in medicine the way that we can control it now that we could not control this in 10 years ago. And we'll see that the future holds a lot of potential, not only in medicine, but in all kinds of different applications in this system. So most of the time when I like try and go through some stuff, it's I usually try and be pretty interdisciplinary and like kind of touch on some other ideas, um, you know, outside the content. A lot of immunology inherently is application of things that, you know, you've learned. This is the application of all the small things that you've learned in biology. This is evolution, you know, within cells. This is how how do we mutate things to get the right cell receptor, for example. So. In this case, the things that I really want to leave you with are, you know, there's a few key types of cells that play a big role in your defense. Those are the ones in, the, in number one. Two, I really want to show you that there are two different ways your immune system gets at things. One is very fast and specific. That's the innate immune system. And we're also going to see the adaptive immune system and how sometimes when you get a pathogen that your, you know, your initial defenses can't get rid of, your body actually evolves cells against it to kill it, basically. And then three, I really do want to get, um, you know, I just want you to be able to think about what is the emerging role here in the immune system as far as medicine? Is it something that we should, you know, kind of poke around with and change and see what the result could be? So in this case, this is kind of what you're up against in the world. Now, remember, in the last 100 years, we've changed things a little bit, to say the least. One of these is no longer the problem that it used to be for homo sapiens, us. Remember that in the last hundred years, for example, we've developed not only hygiene, antibiotics, vaccines, and clean water, but a myriad of other medicines that can actually target these things. But for everybody, and I know, I know it's not like great to ask everybody to speak in Zooms, um, but looking at these, what is something that we have what is something that is not common anymore, you know, for us? And you can think about that for yourself a little bit, because it's a good kind of thinking question. You'll notice here too that pathogen, which is all of these, you know, everything that we're looking at here, these are pathogens, that's in general, basically. You have things that are non-living, such as prions and viruses. Those of you that, you know, were in my section, it's good to see you, by the way. Um, Prions are just basically proteins that fold things wrong, you know, and we'll see why the immune system has not very many defenses against something like that. So in this case, though, you have living things that do try to make your body its home, not necessarily to kill you. They may just consequently kill you accidentally or make you unhealthy. So what we'll see, too, is that it's actually large eukaryotic parasites that our bodies or at least, well, we have kind of eliminated in the last century. This is a eukaryotic parasite being attacked by the immune system and then heavily targeted. So at first, at the beginning of this sequence, you can see that some cells start going towards it and then they send signals to bring more cells. What your immune system can do is basically poison and cook any of these things. And you have to remember, that's a massive animal right there compared to your immune cells. But they can coordinate and attack in such a way that the human body can eliminate immense amounts and strengths of pathogens. So keep this slide in mind. Oh, yeah. And then one thing I should note, um, green slides are more 
these are more like supplemental for your understanding. Blue are things that like, they're not necessarily super fair game. They're just like there to help. You can use them though. And then red is stuff that I would probably design like, you know, the objectives around being fair game. So yeah, I should have prepped that. But keep this in mind, the power of your immune system is massive and it's undersold by the fact that we, a lot of the times, you know, we get sick, but we'll see that there's different reasons why that can happen. Okay. So over here, your white blood cells basically come from a set of stem cells that exist in all of us still. Some of those can go on to become different families. Some of these are pretty familiar, T cells, B cells. I've talked about natural killer cells a little bit, and we'll see a little bit about neutrophils here. These two, macrophages and dendritic cells, and that's kind of where the focus will be. So all of your immune cells, in a lot of cases, they're all related, they're all cousins basically. And one of the reasons why is that as, and we'll, we'll kind of touch on this later, as pathogen evolved, so as viruses evolved, or as you know, bacteria evolved, our immune cells evolved along with them to kill them. It was always a basically an arms race, right? Bacteria would get something, then all of a sudden we would have something, but then bacteria would have a new adaptation. We would need a new adaptation to survive because without the adaptation, the host would die in this case, and that's us. Okay, so we're gonna cover two main things. Basically started with two main questions. How do we start all of those pathogens from literally getting in and causing an exponential infection? That's the biggest, you know, that's the biggest step in a lot of cases. And I'll want you to argue whether or not this innate step is what we're going to cover, which is innate immunity. Is that more powerful than the adaptive immunity that we saw that we're going to see with T and B cells that actually evolve against the pathogen? Okay, so with innate immunity, biggest things is that these are just here. They're just on you. You don't have to supercharge these. They're just ready to protect you. One of the most basic things is literally your skin prevents things from getting inside your body, right? That is an, an example of innate immunity. You have a barrier against things in the outside environment that are around you and possibly could kill you without any defense. So then you start getting a little more specific. You start having cells like phagocytes and dendritic cells. What these two things are going to do is when they see anything that looks like a non-human cell, they will basically like swallow it up and digest it. Now we'll see that that's a defense on one end, but in another case, we'll see that that's actually a way to coordinate response to the full pathogen and we'll see that. So then these two right here, this is, these are plasma proteins. These are something called complement. So if you watch the second video for fun, that's what these were. They're essentially just little protein shapes that recognize pathogen. Because remember, pathogen doesn't look quite like human cells. So these can bind up to pathogen and basically target it for destruction. And then we will cover these in a little bit, just briefly, natural killer cells. Natural killer cells, they have basically receptors on their surface right here, like you see. They are going to be targeted to anything that looks like a bacteria, anything that looks like a virus, anything that looks like a parasite, Natural killer, no, sorry, natural killer cells are ready to go get it. They're always ready to. They're always they're running around your body right now, and they're totally ready. The thing is, is that these never are going to develop any memory against pathogen, and we'll see how memory is a very big component of the human immune system, and how when you get infected by something one time, you're not going to get infected again, right? But the main one here is that your innate immune system is going to recognize things that do not look like they belong here. And that's, that's the big thing. The advantage of the innate immune system highlighted here, it's very quick, it's very, very good at what it does. Okay, this is phagocytosis. This is where, for example, here you have a bacteria and this is a big macrophage. This is one of your cells. It will essentially, and you can watch videos on this, they essentially run and catch bacteria and they eat them essentially and they digest them into tiny little pieces. Now, number one, that gets rid of bacteria, so that's great. So we'll revisit this in the adaptive immune system because these are the link between the innate and the adaptive. So keep that in mind as we keep going. But as, as far as innate defenses, they're just great. They just gobble up stuff that does not belong there. Okay. This is a natural killer cell, and this is an image of natural killer cells attacking a virally infected cell. So what natural killer cells have on them is a huge number of receptors. So if we could 
see, they would have these big surface receptors all over the cell, okay? All of these are targeted on these ends right here to kill specific things, specific structures that are only found in viruses or bacteria, for example. So natural killer cells are your best defense against things that look very, very foreign to your body. Remember that your cells are big eukaryotic cells. If you see anything, for example, that has a cell wall, like fungi or bacteria, or if you see circular DNA, if your body sees this, or, or flagella and cilia, this is where you apply everything that we know about prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. This is where it starts mattering. This is really where it starts mattering because this is what, oh, sorry, this is what triggers your immune system. Think about all the features of prokaryotic cells, fungi, you know, eukaryotic single cells that do not match what we look like as multicellular eukaryotes, right? Anything in here, in this box right here, can be detected by natural killer cells and initiate a response. It's what makes it hard sometimes to send in uh, biotechnology. For example, like if we just want to express a gene and we send in circular DNA like a plasmid and just you know freely send it in, usually your immune cell is going to kill it. So that's why gene therapies kind of failed in the 90s is that your immune cells don't like when things come in that they don't recognize. And we'll see how specific they can actually get. Down on the bottom here, you can see as well, in a lot of cases, sometimes you will get a eukaryotic cell come in. So remember a blood transfusion, for example, if you get blood that doesn't match yours, your immune system will think that that is a, an invasion, okay? Even though it looks human, it doesn't quite match because we'll see that your cells go through an education process essentially to tell what cells are yours and what cells are not yours. Okay, so this is kind of a cool aside. So when Homo sapiens made their emergence, they interbred with Neanderthals in a lot of cases. And so anyone from European or Eastern European descent in a lot of cases is going to have some of these, what we call toll-like receptors. Neanderthals had lived with diseases in their region for a long time. They had these receptors on their natural killer cells. And so there are a lot of toll-like receptors. And like I said, pretty much their role is to exist on natural killer cells and bind up to structures that don't belong on your cells. So like you can see like flagellin that propel bacteria, certain lipoproteins that are only going to be found in bacteria. Single-stranded RNA, for example, that exists as the genome, that's something like HIV virus, right? HIV is made of RNA. So if your body sees RNA floating around or it's being expressed, TLR8 on those natural killer cells can say, okay, there's an infection here. We need to rally the immune system and kill all of this stuff right here. So this was actually a very strange and cool contribution that we found once we sequenced the Neanderthal genome was that we shared a lot of these immune receptors with those, uh, those cousins of ours. Um, those of you that have me in domestication know that there's a whole nother story behind Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, but sadly we have to keep going with science and we can't get into anthropology, right? Okay, so neutrophils. These are fun, but these are the first thing that have to get called up because they're so destructive, okay? Natural killer cells, uh, you know, phagocytosis, that's okay. That's not really gonna hurt you. Neutrophils are the first part of the immune system where we can start saying, if you bring these up to fight infection, they may actually kill you as the host. So you really have to have an infection that is beating back your first initial defenses. So if your natural killer cells and your, you know, your uh, macrophages are losing, neutrophils will be called and they will come in. The thing about neutrophils is that they will start secreting massive amounts of perforin, granzyme, other poisons essentially that will go out and kill everything in an area. Now remember, this is not specific. It's gonna kill everything. It's gonna kill every good cell too, okay? So this is kind of, it's not, a, I would not say this is a last ditch. Because remember, when think about when you have like inflammation, like you get a cut and it gets inflamed, for example. In a lot of cases, that's neutrophils showing up and basically burning out that area. So basically it's a very good way to circle around the infection kill everything around it, even if that means sacrificing a few of your healthy cells. We'll see though that sometimes this can get a bit overwhelming. So remember the worm and how your immune cells came in and started like buzzing it? That was these. 
Okay, so they're very big, big tools. They probably don't get the same press that natural killer cells, T cells and B cells do, but they do a lot of damage. So keep those in mind for any time that you see immune deregulatory things, things like that. We'll revisit them in one clinical setting in a sec. Okay, all cytokines are, and you will hear the word cytokine quite a bit. There are a lot of cytokines, there are different ones. What they are are small signals that are going to be basically spit out by certain cells that are, you know, they're in an environment and they say, we need to communicate with the other immune cells. Cytokines will be essentially transcribed or put out. They will get received by other cells and those other cells will come and basically help in a lot of cases, or they will do the bidding of whatever the cytokine wants them to do. So there are, like I said, there are hundreds of cytokine signals. Some of them are gonna tell the immune system to activate. Some of them are gonna tell the immune system to come here. Some of them are gonna tell the immune system to stop. Because like we saw with the raw power, you will eventually need to stop this system. You can't have your immune system firing at that huge power all the time, right? So in a lot of cases, you know, these have really, really diverse roles. And this is where in medicine, we still don't know the role of every single cytokine on every single cell. So cytokines are important. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about how they can they can also screw up a little bit. We'll see that, but they're very important for coordinating a very large immune response. They need to have there needs to be communication. Okay, this interferons are a very good example of a type of cytokine. So the thing that viruses do is they go in and they infect a cell. When a cell knows that it's being infected, for example, and there's a there's a small window where it knows, it will produce what we call interferon. I don't know what that is. And that will get sent out to all the surrounding cells. What interferon does, and it's a very last ditch thing, it basically says there is a virus around here and it's going to tell all of your normal cells to kill themselves, basically undergo apoptosis, blow up, get rid of everything around the virally infected cell. Because if the virus itself can spread and get to another one, you wanna make sure that that cell is already gone. You don't want the virus to be able to spread because virus, even though it's very protected inside a cell, because remember this cell looks a lot like you and your immune system has a hard time finding that. Virus is very, very, very vulnerable outside of the cell. It looks very different. It's clearly not something that belongs. So if you can make this path where virus has to get to the next cell significantly longer, you stand a way better chance of actually getting rid of it. So, we, this, oh, sorry, this part right here, that's a last ditch medicine in certain final stage cancers and lymphomas. So kind of the thing that I study, we used to send in IRF4, interferon 4 to patients as a last ditch. It was a failed attempt at trying to rally the immune system up to kill cancers. It worked and it cured maybe 5% of people, but you saw the power of the immune system and what it did. When you unleash something like this unregulated as a medicine, the other 95% of patients didn't have, you know, a very good, uh, a very good prognosis to say the least. And this is where, again, we're still kind of playing with fire when it comes to using the immune system as medicine or modulating it. Okay. These are two just good, you know, these are two good slides about how we get in inflammation, why we get fevers, for example. Um, you can kind of just take a look. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory when you get, you know, a certain, you know, when you get a large dose of pathogen and that's usually what takes inflammation. Um, so say you step on a nail or something like in here, you're going to get a ton of cytokines saying, Hey, everybody come here. The immune system needs to rally up here. We need to kill this thing. And they come and they kind of, you know, they form a lot of blood so that your immune systems have nutrients to keep firing. And that's another thing about the metabolism of your new, of your inflam or sorry, of your immune cells. They need tons of energy. They need tons of ATP and energy all the time. So again, that's another like very big application is a lot of the times that your immune system fails, it literally runs out of energy. There's a word in our business called immune exhaustion and that's what happens sadly. So over here with fever, this is when the immune response is so big that a macrophage, and remember these digest stuff, they're gonna come here and they're gonna start signaling to your brain, okay, you need to start making, you need to start raising the temperature and raise the temperature throughout the body and burn this out because we're losing this fight. And they'll only cause a fever when you're losing that fight and when your cells and your inflammation, all that is losing, okay? 
So this is still in the innate side of things though. So we haven't even gotten to the part where we actually hyper evolve cells and target something really specific. Okay. Um, this again, this is something you can watch in the video. We don't have time, but it's an immensely complicated and cool system called complement. It's basically these little proteins that exist in your blood, all of us, you know, quadrillions of them, and they will see microbes or they'll see, you know, virally infected cells and they'll basically plug holes in them or they'll rally the immune system. So it's a very cool, um, it's a very cool system. It's something we're not great at studying still, but we're getting a little better. That video that I shared is really fun to watch if you if you have it's it's their animations are way better than their first one. Okay. So we've been hearing a lot of uh, you know, talk about what the 1918 flu was like. It was very different than what we're going through right now. And it was also exacerbated by the fact that, you know, we were just getting out of a war and you know, things like that. And people also didn't have the same hygiene nor, you know, practices that we do today. So why though, was it that young and old patients in 1918 were the ones that were succumbing, right? Why don't strong immune systems always win? And that's because of something called cytokine storm. The 1918 flu virus didn't kill you. Your immune system did, okay? And there are other things that trigger this too. So you can follow the sequence. Everything goes on, like we said, Dendritic cells, macrophages, they come and they gobble stuff up. They're going to rally things back towards the site of infection. They're going to start killing all these infected cells. Okay, good. That's fine. The problem is, is that, and like we talked about, you need to relax your immune system eventually. And certain types of pathogen will not let your immune system stop. They're too different. They're too weird. They keep sending out cytokines all of a sudden. Your immune cells do. They won't stop. And remember, cytokines are active activations. So what this is, is it's a feed forward cycle. So some activation cytokines go out, they activate more cells. Now twice as many cells send out twice as many cytokines. Now four times as cells send out four times as many cytokines. And eventually it's a runaway cycle to the point that your immune system is completely out of control. And remember the power that we showed with that immune system destroying that cell or destroying that worm? Your immune system at this point, especially your innate immune system, will be completely set on destroying everything it sees, including you. This is where we see a lot of systemic damage when it comes to some of the most destructive viruses. It's not really them doing it. It's our immune overreaction. And this is something that has kind of more been documented in the last hundred years. This is something that since the advent of uh, you know, kind of the industrial age, we've seen that our immune system is not as well regulated as it used to be. It gets out of control way more. So you don't ever want to end up here. It's not really anybody's fault if they do. It's just the fact that some viruses and some pathogens can really, really, you know, talk to your immune system. Okay. In this case, obviously, there is an application of what we're talking about today. How, for example, does a COVID, does a coronavirus evade all of the defenses that we just saw? Essentially, what it does is it is going to stop interferons from going out. It is going to stop, yeah, interferon gamma and type 1. If you stop those two responses, or at least you kind of mask them, COVID is very good at this. This is its main adaptation, is it basically slinks by your innate immune system, infects a few cells, and then it multiplies out of control. And then your immune system comes and aggressively attacks it. That's where a lot of the tissue damage comes from, is all this, the innate cells that we just covered, they come in and do so much damage that that's the, that's the issue, okay? That's what coronaviruses are known for is evading these initial things by messing with the cytokines that we've talked about. They mess with the communication system of the immune system, and we basically can't coordinate a response. Strangely, and this is, this is where things get complicated, is that the cells or the, the genes all highlighted here, kind of in green and yellow, red, these are cytokines right here, for example, the ones that cause lymphomas, like I study, 
they're the same ones that help you fight. So if you have too many of these fight signals at the wrong time too, you also can get cancer. And so, like I said, it's a very difficult balance between good and bad when you look at our immune system. You can have hyperactive immune systems that are out of control. You can have you know, compromised ones that can't put up the fight that they need. Somewhere in the middle you wanna be, but we are still not really close to finding out what the perfect immune system really looks like. If we were, that's probably where medicine would head. Okay, cool. I would say the innate immune system is super powerful to talk about, but eventually you do get to the point where this infection is this infection is here and we have ran out of tools to just regular fight it. We need something new. We need to hyper evolve something against a single pathogen that we've never seen before. And that was the birth of the adaptive immune system. In this case, this is where you are going to target your response. This is where you're going to find something about this pathogen, just a piece of it. Can be any, it can be any part of it. You're gonna find a piece of this pathogen and you are going to train your immune system and educate it to attack that piece, okay? And that is gonna be a targeted response that your immune system, again, is never gonna forget either, which is great. Now, we'll see again why there are certain weaknesses of this. Number one, your adaptive immune system takes a lot of energy and it takes about five to seven days to mount a response. So this isn't something that you can just go and quickly do. Okay, this is a great comparison between what we've seen and what we're gonna see now. So macrophage, dendritic cells, these two are kind of the same. Remember, they digest stuff. Here's your natural killer cell. And we talked about neutrophils. All of these in the innate immune system, just like it says here, super quick, super rapid. Hopefully we can just get rid of everything right then. But it's the adaptive that's slow, specific, costly, but it is the most powerful when it comes to actually eliminating everything from the body. And that's where you have two things. And these are designed against two different types of pathogen. We'll see the B cells and T cells. B cells are named, um, people call it for bone marrow. It's actually named after birds that it was studied in. That's kind of weird. I'm a B cell biologist and I hate that story. Um, T cells are named for the thymus. That's where they come from. And so we'll see that the two major products of these cells, one is gonna be antibodies and the other are gonna be two types of T cells. Well, three when I'll show you by the end. CD4 are helper T cells, CD8, these are your killer T cells. These are the ones that go in and get everything out of your system. Okay. Like I said, I like having kind of an interdisciplinary style of lecture. What you're seeing in the immune system is an ecology, right? You are seeing something that it is a like a kind of a predator prey an adaptation response, right? A back and forth, an arms race, like I said. These pathogens are evolving constantly because to evolve, you are going up against something that is forcing only the strongest, or sorry, only the fittest of you to produce offspring and move on, right? We have that same capability. And I do use the word hyper-evolved because you will see you will change the DNA of your immune cells. They're the only thing on, on, you know, in your body that has a different genome than your other cells. They hypermutate to get to the perfect point where they can kill things. Okay. This is where it gets, this is where we start getting more into like the pure medicine that we do control and we'll see that. So bacteria, viruses, they have pieces of them that do not look human and our cells know that. We can call these antigens. In a lot of cases, these are spike proteins or receptors that they need to bind. And in this case here, this is, this is just kind of another, view. this is one view, here's another view right here. So pieces of pathogen are antigen. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna expect you to know or like test on this, but epitope is just the piece of the antigen. So it's an even more specific target basically. And in this case, your immune system is going to train itself to kill anything that looks like this piece. Because this piece, even though it's just a little triangle, let's say it's a big protein on the surface of a cell, that piece does not belong, it is not human, and your immune system is now on the adaptive side going
going to evolve a cell that kills just that thing. Okay. All right, this is one of the more, and you'll, you'll see this later if you take physiology. This is one of the more important ways that cells communicate. All right, so follow with me kind of step-by-step step here because I don't want to lose, lose anybody because this is, this is something even as a B cell biologist I had, to, I had to learn. So remember your dendritic cells and your macrophages. Remember they gobbled up those pieces of antigen. Remember they basically ate these pieces. They, they ate these whole things. What they did is they digested them into pieces. They digested them into antigen, okay? They are actually going to take those little pieces and they are going to present them on a big surface receptor called MHC class two, major, sorry, major histocompatibility process, basically. There's a lot of names for it. So what these cells are doing, even though they are a part of the innate immune system, they're taking these antigens and they're gonna pl place them up here. What that is going to do is that is going to attract the attention of a T cell. And in this case, it's a little helper T cell, okay? That is the first step in communicating to the outside the immune system. What these molecules do, and especially MHC2, is it is telling basically your immune system, here is the antigen that is coming outside the body. That is what is outside the body because these antigen and epitopes right here, they came from a cell that was digested outside, you know, yeah, some nasty pathogen like that. They came from the outside, they were digested, they were put on this receptor, and that's going to activate this helper T cell up here. The reason you need to do that is that these dendritic cells and macrophages, they're the only ones that can do that. They're the only ones with MHC class two that can communicate that something is weird outside in the body. Because the difference is, is that only, only APCs, so those two cells up here, it's just like a quick name for them. They're the only ones that can communicate what is outside in the body, what is floating around that shouldn't be here. MHC1 though, on the other hand, this is just your system. Every cell in your body has an MHC1. It basically just digests stuff that's inside your cell and presents it on the outside of your cell. So in this case, it's just gonna present whatever is inside your cell at the moment. A killer cytotoxic CD8 T cell is gonna come in and it's gonna read that and it's gonna decide whether or not to kill the cell. Because if it's something that shouldn't be inside a cell, like a virus, like how viruses go inside cells, then it's gonna eliminate the cell. So MHC1s are your best way for your T cells, your killer T cells to see, okay, that cell is infected with a virus because it keeps producing virus on the edge of its MHC class one. So that's the way that you can actually tell what's going on inside a cell is these two receptors. These are, these are, yeah, these are, these are not the easiest thing to learn the first time around. Um, but they are super important when it comes to coordinating this response. And it's super cool that they essentially can communicate to the other cells in the cellular language that we've seen, which is cell receptors, what is going on inside the body. So with that step in mind, we can activate three new tools, helper T cells, cytotoxic killer T cells, and T regulatory cells. And keep the ones on the right, the T regs in mind for later. They don't do quite the same thing as these do. Helper T cells, they can bind to those, um, those antigen presenting cells and say, okay, something's up. We need to start sending out cytokines everywhere. That's what helper T cells do. They send out those cytokine signals that say, activate the immune system, we need help right now. That's their main thing is they activate the immune system. And it's very good that you have a check on the immune system because again, you don't want the immune system just going crazy. This is good to have like a step that they have to hit before it starts because a lot of the times these are going to unleash the cytotoxic T cells. These are the ones that are going to run around. They're going to bind to that MHC1, which shows what is inside the cell and it is going to start killing stuff. Anything that matches this TCR, this T cell receptor, this is going to be, this has basically been evolved in this case and this specific T cell so it's not innate. 
this has been evolved against a specific type of pathogen that something looks like, right? And that's going to go in and kill that cell, anything that has that. Okay. We will take a look at T regulatory cells, but what their role is, is to slow the immune system down. So we call them T regs for short, for short. They basically stop the immune system. They, they calm it down essentially. And we'll see why that's very important, but as you can imagine, you don't want your T cells just running around all the time. So helper T cells are super good. They're gonna attack, they're gonna help not only T cells um, start basically binding and getting going, but they're also gonna help B cells. So B cells are the ones that are gonna produce those big giant Y-shaped antibodies right here. And these are gonna go and bind to antigen. The only way that you start the B cell response is that you have activated helper T cells. They're the only ones that are gonna allow you to do that. So we'll cover how B cells kind of do their thing. Um, most people are more excited by killer T cells. That's, that's not fair for me as a B cell biologist. That makes me sad, but it's okay. I'm gonna try and I'll try and convince you that that's not the case. Um, but you need helper T cells to activate that full immune response. Otherwise it kind of just remains regular. Okay. So again, regulatory T cells, these, their whole role is to say, stop the infections over or stop killing this area of the body. It's over. Okay. Cause you do need a stop signal. So they're, they're very good at what they do. They can get deregulated though. Um, one of the, one of the main ways that pathogen can avoid getting killed is it can send fake signals to T regs to these to these T regs right here that cause them to show up and stop all of these immune cells from killing the pathogen. So they're not the smartest things on the planet, and they're pretty easily manipulatable. Um, they're okay though. You'll see. You don't want your immune system going crazy all the time, so it's good that there is a stop signal. Okay, this is in green, so don't worry. But this is how you essentially get a B cell response. Essentially, an antigen is going to be presented to a naive B cell over here. So it's never seen any antigen. It is going to, at first, just expand in a big pile of clones of itself. But what happens is that this molecule right here, this is the key gene that it's trying to change and trying to make better. And it's going to do that through somatic hypermutation. So when you have a gene that makes this cell surface receptor up here, this is essentially your surface antibody because eventually you're gonna make something that is going to secrete all these little antibodies out into the world or all into the body and they're gonna go kill a pathogen. You first have to make the very best possible one. Okay, so let's revisit this, but let's go over kind of this sequence right here. So in the beginning, these small B cell receptors, and remember there's millions of B cells but only one is really gonna be the very best one at binding. And that's the competition and that's the hyper evolution that B cells go through. They have these little surface, basically antibodies up there. And when you encounter this new antigen, only the best binding B cell is actually going to be allowed to survive because it's the only one getting a growth signal from that antigen. Now this is all in the development part. So in this case, if it's a good binder, it will be allowed to present that antigen on its surface. And that surface is going to come in contact with a T helper cell. So again, the T helper cells are the ones that unlock the potential of B cells to say, okay, you can make more of this because you're very good at binding it. So if it gets the right amount of cytokine signals, it's going to activate this B cell. Now it becomes what we call, it's still a B cell, a plasma cell, but now the antibodies are all being secreted. And these antibodies, what they do is they bind to pathogen. See how this can bind to it like a bacteria and it'll basically eliminate it. And remember, these are very targeted. The ends on these are completely targeted to only attack certain pieces of foreign pathogen. And that's how it's a very specific response. And again, this is also how you get memory because these antibodies, these are what are always going to be around in your body running around and killing the pathogen if it ever shows up again. So what happens is that in that pile of B cells that's evolving, so let's go back here just quick. What this cycle is doing here is it is promoting the very strongest B cell that binds the best to that one antigen. It's, promo it's basically a fight to the death to see who can bind that the best. And I maybe, yeah, I probably should have done this slide later. Um, 
but essentially it's this massive cycle to see who has the best section right here that is going to be able to bind. So if this is antigen right here in red, and this is that like kind of that Y shape right here in this V region, that's the perfect immune response because that is going to bind the proteins just like specifically at a specific spot. And the cool thing is that the genes that make these regions, these V regions, and they do combine into this huge chain, they hypermutate. They change their amino acid sequence a lot so that they get even just a little better at binding that pathogen. And the way that you can do that is, yeah, if you get a mutation in a B cell that's bad, okay, it dies. We have a million more to choose from. Keep hyper evolving, keep trying to make the best protein that you can. And so that's, that's why B cells are special. Hopefully I didn't butcher it because I know that sometimes I talk about this and it's not, uh, it's, it's not the, like, the way that I learned it sometimes. I'm just kind of excited about it sometimes. But we can go over this again if you have questions. I'm, I'm happy to stay. Okay. In this case, based on what we've kind of come up with, does a coronavirus, as far as we can tell, as far as you can tell, does it have to beat the innate or the adaptive immune system to make, you know, get to the symptoms that we see sometimes? Which one can it beat? And is one unbeatable? So I don't, nobody needs to actually speak, it's okay. Um, but just think about it, like, based on what we saw, what is, what is the section that is actually being overcome in this case? And in this case, I would direct you probably to think what, uh, you know, essentially what, um, sorry, what the recovery looks like. Is that's that's probably what I'd point to, but okay. So the reason that we have B and T cells is that they have two very specific jobs. T cells have to kill your infected cells that have something wrong inside them. B cells they make antibodies that go and bind stuff that are big foreign structures. They kill stuff that is literally like a cell that's inside you that's wrong. So that's why I think B cells are way like, way better is because they'll, they'll send out antibodies against almost anything. T cells real niche is that they can kill virally infected cells. B cells have a harder time with that because you don't wanna make a, you don't wanna make an immune response against your own cells. So this is kind of the big difference between is that B cells are always going to kill things that are outside of your cells T cells can help too, and that's good, because um, these can actually get inside your cells. Fungi and protozoa can get inside your own cells, and that's where a T cell is actually going to come in. T cells specialize, though, in finding cells that have been infected from within. Uh, you'll also notice that prions have no immune response to them, and that's uh, that's pretty much true as far as we can tell. We have no way to target them. So. Maybe, yeah, definitely don't eat deer if, uh, if, you, if you shot it and it didn't look, um, if it didn't look very healthy. Yeah, don't get, don't get chronic wasting disease, please. Okay. Lastly, this is where, again, medicine comes in. Like we talked about, the raw power of the immune system is devastating, especially when it targets you accidentally, okay? So here's a B cell, you know, here's antigen. This is the same figure that we looked at. Hooray, this is going to target an immune, you know, this is going to target an immune response. Problem is though, here's a beta cell from your pancreas. By accident, through whatever means, if your immune system accidentally develops an adaptive immune response, so B and T cell against one of your cells, it will hunt that cell down forever. It will always think that that cell is a pathogen trying to invade and it will send a full immune response against it, usually just eliminating that type of cell forever. And that's not, um, that's not something that we can reverse right now. It's not something that we're very good at, you know, coming back from. And again, it's a, it's kind of a testament against, um, it's a testament to the power again of your adaptive immune cells and how specific it, it can actually be and the power that it has. So the way that they, we usually try and prevent that is that during the development of B or T cells, at a very early stage, they are exposed to a collection of your cells. And that's their education. That's their education to say, don't attack this type of cell. This is us. This is self. Don't ever attack this. And 
sometimes that process fails and your cells will get out and they will evolve, like we said in that hyper evolution, to attack your cells because they see your cells as antigen accidentally. And we're still getting okay. Well, we're trying to get better at predicting and treating this process. But again, you do want to have two regulatory cells in this process. So, Ray, this is the, yeah, I know we're at time, sorry. Um, this is kind of a scale of diseases that look the most, basically, how do they mimic self? Viruses look the most foreign next to bacteria, prokaryotes, fungi or eukaryotes, but they're def definitely weird looking, large parasites. Then it gets harder to find because self looking things are very hard for your immune system to kill. A cancer cell pretty much just looks like you. So it's really hard for your immune system to target and kill. Like we saw prions, literally, you can't tell the difference between them. So that's things. Um, shoot, sorry. Um, if you guys got to go, you can go, but I'll, um, I'll just, I'll continue. I have like three more things and they're mainly the medicine stuff. Uh, this is one way that we lose is, oops, sorry. Um, you have antigens Sorry, can, on... can I just stop for a second? So if yeah, you have go to go, that's fine. So anything past this point won't be um, yeah. fair game for me. But thank you all for coming. Yeah. And if you have to go, have a good rest of the day. Yep. Um, this is how immune systems can lose, is if they have some kind of shift or drift, sometimes the antigen that is initially presented is going to get reorganized or it's going to mutate and your immune system can't do another new response to it, and it's not gonna be fast enough. So speaking of ecology, the one way that we actually can win this battle is actually set predators loose. As we can tell, this is a mongoose. Sometimes they don't eat what we want them to eat when we set them loose in certain environments. Um, but one way to avoid antibiotics is actually set viruses against bacteria, for example, because antibiotics don't target, they target pretty much everything. Viruses, on the other hand, would target just a few things. They're very specific and they're very evolved to just target one thing. And then this is the final thing. And this is kind of where immune, you know, kind of immune health is possibly going is we can engineer T cells in a lab to express whatever we want. And that's kind of the cool thing where medicine could head someday is, and because what we're doing in cancer right now is we send in, you know, a gene and we make a, a T cell from a patient, express the target gene for a cancer. I don't imagine that we couldn't do this for something else and engineer an immune system someday. But until that day, it's, uh, it's definitely gonna be a little different. So we'll see. And that's what CAR T is essentially. You're gonna put T cells back into a patient after you modify them and kind of go from there. So very exciting, unfortunately very expensive and also lots of side effects. So happy to talk about those if, uh, if you have any questions, but overall, thank you. Yeah, I know this is early in the morning, but thanks for thanks for tuning in.